All right, welcome everybody to uh, the HO Colloquium today. Uh, our speaker today is Johannes Lerner Butcher um, from uh, the Leibniz Institute for Sonnenphysik, formerly, um, which was uh, until very recently known as the Kiepenheuer Institute for Sonnenphysik in Freiburg, Germany. Uh, Johannes got his uh, PhD there and also did a postdoc. Uh, but now, Johannes is the newest HAO postdoc, so we're very excited to have him, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what he used to do before he came here. Yeah. Thank you, Alfred. Um, I'm happy to be here and to give a talk about my recent work um, today. Um, well, I, I crossed some fields in the last years, so uh, as you can see, I did a lot of work about sunspots, um, also in my PhD thesis on sunspot waves um, and in the last um, three years, so from 2016 to 2018, um, I worked as an instrument scientist and postdoc at KISS working with the LAS instrument which I will talk about today. And uh, well now I'm here, I'm glad uh, to be a member of HAO now and today I will give a talk about ultra precise solar spectroscopy and um, maybe uh, you, you've seen it already on the first, uh, first slide here you can see uh, a spectrum and this is the spectrum of uh, laser frequency comp but at low dispersion if you go to high dispersion you can see really comp modes like I sketched here on the logo of the instrument so uh, ultra precise solar spectroscopy what I'm what I want to um, transfer today, which information is, why do we need a one meter per second accuracy for solar observations? So um, I have made up a little motivation before I start with the actual uh, presentation of my results. So I put the question here, why are we aiming at solar observations with less than one meter per second accuracy? First of all, because we can, yeah, why not? Then, actually, we want to detect act accurate Doppler velocities in the solar atmosphere yeah, to get as precise as possible. Then, compare with other former solar observations, check if they, um, if they had the same velocities, maybe. And then, test and refine synthesis um, for atmospheric models and maybe um, to correct them. Then, well, one of my goals was provide accurate reference velocities for other future observations, maybe to calibrate Doppler grams of other future instruments with this high precision and then transfer our knowledge about the Sun to other stars. And what can we learn about this? Yeah. If we know for the Sun um, processes at the meter per second accuracy, we can, for example, improve the detection of potentially habitable Earth-like exoplanets. Yeah. And I want to, to present a test bed here, which um, some slides I got from Ansgar Reiners uh, of the Institute of Astrophysics in Göttingen. And um, I want to present the motivation, can we detect the solar system with this accuracy? So, of course, we have the sun, we have our, our, um, our planets. And if we make radial velocity measurements, like sketched here, yeah, observe the sun or any host star with a planet or an exoplanet surrounding it, then the star shifts a little bit toward us and away from us. So we have a variation, a periodic variation due to the surrounding planet. Yeah, and this we can measure. So let's, for example, look at a test data set. We see here on the right radial velocity of the sun relative to the barycenter of the solar system. And yeah, you, so you observe the sun, and it shifts 50 meters toward you and away from you, with um, 
a variation here, a periodical variation, and it looks almost as it would be the same as for our solar cycle. But it is not, it comes from Jupiter. Okay, and exoplanet detection was actually here, the plan planet hunting epoch, only in the last 20 to 25 years. So if we have a perfect data set and we sum all the radial velocity signals of the planets, which are here, Jupiter would be with 12 meters per second in amplitude, um, about a period of 12 years. Then we would have Saturn with 2.5 meters per second and a period of 29 years. And we have Earth and Venus at a centimeter per second scale. You can't even see uh, the oscillation of the RV signal anymore. Um, and this goes with Earth with one year, of course, and Venus with 225 days. And we have Mars and Mercury at the mi millimeter per second scale. Um, but of course, with uh, le um, less per um, periodic variation. So our perfect data set, we sum all um, the RV signals and add some small artificial noise. Say, OK, we have one observation per day with a meter per second um, accuracy and precision. Can we detect our planets, theoretically? So if um, <coughs> we would observe for 10 years, we would have such an RV signal for our perfect data set. And if we make uh, our uh, Fourier analysis, so compute the power spectrum, you would see here we have a lot of power um, at this year scale, 20 to 30 years from Saturn and Jupiter, but we cannot distinguish them. We have here would be the signal of Mars. We, can, we cannot see it at all. Earth, we cannot see but Venus already has a slight increase. If we observe for 20 years, we can still not distinguish Saturn and Jupiter. Mars, no. Earth, yeah, we can already see it. Venus, yes. So now let's go to 50 years. So, and you say you can see Venus, but there's like power right next to it that's basically at the same um, same amplitude, just to uh, to sh uh, shorter wavelengths. Um, as well. Yeah. So, I, how can you say that you can see Venus? Well, you you you, you know you know in this in this plot you know uh, the period which you are looking at. Fair enough. Yeah. So okay, I can see that there's a signal there, but. If somebody gave me this plot and didn't tell me what it was, I wouldn't be able to see that that was Venus. I think. Okay. Anyway, keep going. Okay, so, um, well, okay. Let's go to 50 years. And um, now you can distinguish Saturn and Jupiter. Still no Mars. Earth is gone. No, no clue why. And, well, now we can see Venus. <laughs> Let's go to 200 years. So, still no Mars. We can detect the Earth, and now we have a clear signal of Venus. Yeah, you would be satisfied with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, keep in mind, one observation per day with one meter per second accuracy. To get a really nice signal, we would have to observe for 200 years our solar system, our Sun, which we can uh, observe better than other stars, of course. So, but the sun is active. Yeah? We have a solar cycle, so we have variation of the convective blue shift. So, assume we have a convective blue shift, which is at the same maybe amplitude of some meters per second, at the same variation uh, at the order of years. It could overlie the signal of exoplanets. So we have to be sure what is our intrinsic solar uh, oscillation or the signal from the sun itself. So we have to make these accurate measurements and correction models of these solar features. 
So now, how do we do this? Ultra precise solar spectroscopy. We did this um, in the last three years, which is a project called LARS, and the instrument as well is called like this. So this is the laser absolute reference spectrograph. I come to this later to the approbation. I just quickly want to present the team members, which were uh, Wolfgang Schmidt, <coughs> the PI of the, of the project, myself, and um, some co-observers with the instrument, which were Rolf Schlichenmeier, uh, Eric, Franziska, and Martha were students of mine at Kippenheuer Institute. Then uh, Thomas Kentischer, Nazareth Bayo Gonzalez, and Martin Franz at, at Kiepenheuer, now, now known as Leibniz Institute. And um, we had Hans Peter Dörr, who designed the instrument uh, initially, and uh, the guys from um, MPQ in Garching and Menlo System who designed the laser frequency comp. Um, I refer to some publications which we did in the last um, two and a half years. Um, about the instrument, about um, observations in sunspot umbra, and a series of articles about the convective blue shift in the solar atmosphere. So let me describe the instrument in some slides. So the instrument is located at the Vacuum Tower Telescope on Tenerife, um, and light is guided to the instrument itself, and there it is integrated into single mode fibers. So we integrate the light from a field of view, like one, three, or ten arc second field of view, and um, we observe it with a spectrograph. And the spectrograph of the VTT itself has a high spectral resolution, more than 700,000 in the visible. Um, we do a absolute wavelength calibration with a laser frequency comp. This is why we have here the laser uh, name of the instrument. And this gives us the instrumental accuracy of a meter per second. And uh, well, the operating range of the instrument is indivisible. So we focus on, on these lines spectroscopically. The instrument setup is like, uh, is like this. So we integrate the light from, from a, a spatial region, a field of view of one, ten, three or ten arc seconds, and we give the light to a single mode fiber which guides the light to the spectrograph. And this gives us the identical illumination of the spectrograph, which is crucial to get this uh, accuracy. So you can see here the light beam to the fiber and then to the spectrograph where it is analyzed. But this was not enough. Uh, we want to make uh, fast changes between 1, 3, or 10 arc seconds. So what I did, I integrated here a translation stage and made for each channel an individual fiber, uh, which is then guided to a fiber switch, and there you can select the channel which you give to the spectrograph. Then for calibration um, of your spectrum, you need flash fielding, so you need to calibrate the, uh, the artificial um, uh, signals on your, on your spectrum with a normal tungsten lamp, a helium neon laser um, for initial calibration of the uh, instrument, and a hollow cathode lamp. So you really can observe your own emission profiles of your atomic transitions, which is later important for your absolute Doppler velocities to determine them. And the heart of the instrument is this laser frequency comp. Uh, this is a very elaborate technology which got the Nobel Prize in 2005. And what you have is um, a femtosecond pulsed laser. Yeah? You have these pulses here, and if you transfer your time into the frequency domain, uh, you get these emission modes, these comp modes. And for each comp mode, you know the repetition. You know the repetition rate um, before. You know um, offset frequency, which you can determine by the phase shift within the envelope of your, of your pulse. And you know, well, you have to determine first which number is which. But if you know one number, you know the frequency of each comp mode. And this serves as your absolute ruler for your, um, 
for your calibration for your solar spectrum. Okay, here I have sketched 250 megahertz. This uh, is still um, too fine for our spectrograph, so we have to filter the signal first. This we do with two Fabry Perot cavities, similar ones, and we filter to a free spectra spectral range of comp modes at 8 gigahertz. If you transfer this into doubler velocities or shifts of doubler velocities, it would be like 4 to 5 kilometers per second. So you can, um, you have a dis, you can, you can determine which mode is which, yeah, so you know for sure. Um, okay, then the signal uh, is amplified and compressed, but the signal is still at a, a range in the infrared at 1060 nanometer. So you have to broaden it to get it to this uh, um, visible range. This you do with uh, some uh, quantum magic. Yeah, you use a, a photonic crystal fiber. You have here the core of the of the fiber where the light is guided through. You have the the air gaps in black, and uh, this this fiber is tapered, so it is thinned for a specific distance, and then you have the broadening to a wider range. So and then the light is guided to the fiber switch, and what we do is then have data. So alternating observations, COM spectrum, which serves as a ruler, and then solar spectrum. So you can calibrate uh, your solar spectral in, in real time at the second scale. And here you can see an exam example uh, of, a, of a spectrum at uh, 6302. So we have these two iron lines and the oxygen lines and um, these telluric lines. And uh, you have the frequency comp here in green. Um, the spectra are at different positions on the sun. So here is the heliocentric position 1.0. This is disk center. And here 0.3 is close to the solar limb. And um, here are these emission uh, signals from this hollow cathode lamp. I will come to this uh, in, a, in a minute. So data calibration is also very tricky to get to this accuracy. So of course, easy steps are dark and flat field correction. But then you have this absolute wavelength calibration with a comp. And intrinsically, for the instrument, it is 0 0.1 meter per second. But then you have to, you, you, well, you have motions between the Earth and the Sun. Yeah? You have rotations. So you have to calibrate all of that stuff. So first of all, we use this ephemeris code by Hans-Peter Dörr and we get an accuracy of a few centimeters per second. Well, the, the Earth orbits the Sun, so we have to get rid of the orbital motion. Um, it rotates, the sun rotates, we, we correct for that too, um, using a solar rotation model, a spectroscopic one of Snodgrass and Ulrich. And then we have to correct for the gravitational and redshift of the sun and the earth. And uh, combined together, it is of the order of uh, 635 meters per second. OK. But to get accurate Doppler velocities, well, now we have accurate wavelengths, but we need accurate Doppler velocities. So we need a zero reference of your, of, of your line. So we need to measure, or we have to get a reference, laboratory reference, um, for your wavelength. Normally, you would take uh, the data from NIST and um, compare. But we did our own measurements and got results um, more accurate at one magnitude, at one magnitude scale. So we have um, an accuracy of this um, of this line of this wavelength of the order of two to five meters per second, and this is also the accuracy you have for your Doppler um, velocities. Then, so you uh, subtract from your observations the, the laboratory reference, divide by it, uh, subtract the gravitational redshift multiply by the speed of light, and you get the Doppler velocity. So now we have our instrument. Now I thought, OK, 
what would be nice to have. So we have one meter per second or a few meter per second accuracy. What do we want to know about the sun? So I thought maybe it would be interesting to see for into sunspot umbra and ask the question, is the dark umbral core really at rest? Maybe you, you have seen a paper by Jacques Beckers, 1977, um, where he measured the um, Doppler velocity uh, in umbral core. And this measurement, well, he obtained like zero meter per second at the average. And this zero meter per second <coughs> average was applied to Doppler gram calibration. So a lot of Doppler grams in former studies have been calculated with, uh, with the umbral velocity as, as a reference. So I wanted to check, is it really zero? Because now we know. So I did observations um, in several uh, sunspots, 12 uh, different sunspots, 12 observations. Um, observations were for more than 30 minutes to, to get an average over the acoustic signal of the um, modes and waves. Um, the umbra was at all the time more than 10 arc seconds in diameter and the field aperture uh, we choose was three arc seconds. So you can see it sketched here in red at the darkest part of the uh, umbra. And the cadence was 2.5 seconds. We got a good sampling um, in time. We used uh, a titanium one line at 5714. You can see it here for the quiet sun. And if you go to the umbra, the line gets deeper. Yeah? So it is temperature sensitive. And the nice thing is it has a Landy factor of zero. So it is not sensitive to the Seaman effect. And actually, what was also nice is this was the line Beckers used, 1977. So we can compare it directly. We did uh, our own measurements and have the reference wavelength, so we can be sure uh, that we are right at the five meter per second um, accuracy, <coughs> conservatively set, and make a direct comparison. So if I compute, for example, the bisector, so the midpoints along the spectral line depth for quiet sun and umbra, you can see here minus means uh, blue shift. So in the quiet sun, this line gives, gives a blue shift of around 300, 350 meters per second. And well, of course, the convection is reduced toward the umbra. And there we have still, well, it is reduced, but it is not reduced to zero. And um, if you compare all sunspots, all observations, then you would see, OK, they are uh, in the range of minus 90 meters per second up to maybe minus 20 meters per second. So it is not zero. And then we cross-checked with HMI observations and looked what would be the magnetic field strength for these sunspots and made a plot here. And well, maybe it does not follow a linear fit, maybe also a saturation here, but the stronger your magnetic field strength is, the less blue shift you have. Yeah? And maybe if you want to calibrate your Doppler gram with the umbral velocity, maybe you can just see, OK, how much is it in magnetic field strength and apply this criterion and get it uh, accurate of the order of maybe 50 meters per second. So the other big part of the observations was the convective blue shift of the quiet zone. <coughs> You know this very precise because when we do this, we can apply it to the uh, to other stars, our knowledge, and maybe improve the detection of exoplanets. So convective blue shift, um, how how does it work? So we have here uh, a granular uh, pattern of granules and intergranular lanes in, in dark, and um, if you integrate over this area, you will get um, a summed spectrum over um, blue shifts from granules and red shifts from intergranulum. And if you, um, if you combine these spectra, you would, give, uh, you would get an uh, asymmetric line profile. 
Yeah. Because the intergranulum mm, induces a red shift or a weaker blue shift um, in the upper part of your line profile. So here you can see a bisector um, midpoints at each line depth. And this gives you the asymmetry. And you can see here, for example, at this position, we have the maximum blue shift along the line uh, of 400 meters per second. We have here this iron 6301.5 line. And toward the line core, this blue shift decreases to less than 100 meters per second. And why is that so? So this strong blue shift comes, of course, from the, uh, from the granules. But if you go higher up in the atmosphere or lower down in your spectral line profile, well, of course, you have a gradient in velocity along the atmosphere. But secondly, your granulation pattern inverses, you have inverse granulation. So um, the upward motion of the uh, granules is darker than the intergranular. So, um, Starting from this, we made observations in very different uh, spectral regions, and I choose spectral regions which would be interesting um, in future. So, observed by the DKIST telescope, um, by by the instruments WISP or VTF, or also for by sunrise by the third sunrise flight. So, for example, here these iron two lines at five to five or, um, of course, you have H, uh, HMI line here at 6173, or, of course, 6302. But also interesting, sodium D. So this line goes high up in the photosphere, up to the lower chromosphere. And uh, we'll see how, how your atmosphere behaves. In total, we, have, we had six observation campaigns of two to three weeks each and a total observation time of more than 300 hours. So I spent a lot of time up on the mountain, but it was nice. <laughs> so um, the observation scheme was like this. Here we have um, the quiet sun. Well, of course, this made sense because in the last three years we had a lot of quiet sun. And um, I observed along four radial axes North, east, north, south, east, west, and at the disk center, and sampled um, from disk center toward the limb at different heliocentric positions. Yeah, heliocentric position, cosine of the heliocentric angle from 1.0 to 0 0.2 at the very, <coughs> so, very solar limb. And um, the observations were 20 minutes each, because why? Okay, we want to average over P modes. Because they they vary at a scale of 100 meters per second or more, and maybe you have noticed already here these ellipses they become bigger toward the limb, and um, well what I did is I I took the telescope pointing and uh, oscillated around a nominal position to average over more granules, and um, I increased the oscillation toward the limb because I did not want to have um, supergranular motion. Because when I don't do this, I could sit on either one of the sides of the of a supergranule, and which could shift by 100, 200, 300 meters per second. And I want the systematic convective blue shift in average. You can see here what happens if I, if I don't include this oscillation and observe for like eight hours, a supergranule would shift towards, uh, would shift through my my observation. Uh, you can see it here. So, take in mind these positions we had here, and we did observations, uh, for example, for the six one seven three line, and these are all the observations along the different axes and the average in black with the standard deviation, and you can see, well, this is the line core of the line, um, how your convective blue shift behaves systematically from disk center here on the left towards the solar limb. So you have a strong blue shift here at 
200 meters per second, which increases slightly if you go a, ba a bit away from your disk center, and then turn, even turns into a redshift uh, at the solar limb. So we thought, uh, would this be what we would expect and compared it with, with a synthesis, synthesis of Hans Günther Ludwig from Heidelberg and saw, okay, yeah, this co corresponds very well, um, even better than, than expected. So this, we would assume, would be the uh, systematic convective blue shift of the sun. So and if we go now to our asymmetry of the line profile, this changes a lot. For example, if we have uh, a bisector, so the asymmetry of, of the, our line at disk center, we would see a beautiful C shape. Yeah? But if we go towards the solar limb, around here, 0.3, this convective blue shift, or this, this C shape profile turns into more of a backslash shape and turns into a redshift at the line core. So the position really changes a lot uh, when you observe spectroscopy. Since we used the uh, 6173 line, we, we thought, OK, let's compare it with HMI. What do they get? And we averaged along the north-south axis and um, well, averaged also heliocentrically and uh, compared both profiles. And surprisingly, both curves did not match very well. So you have here in purple uh, the HMI um, profile. Uh, you have still a lot of supergranulation here. The average in time was not, not very, uh, very long. But uh, the HMI fit also already gives you um, the, the deviation from our observed profile. So we thought, OK, we have a high spectral resolution of more than 700,000 of our, our spectrograph. HMI has only 81,000, more or less. And could this affect um, these both curves? And HMI has only six nominal positions. So what we did, we convolved our high resolution spectrum to the lower resolution of HMI and took only these six positions and applied the Fourier method of HMI. And we were expecting both curves match rather well then, but what happened is still a deviation. So we entered literature, also our own, and saw, OK, maybe this deviation comes from the instrumental fringe pattern of HMI itself. You can see these blue shifts and red shifts, and they are of, of the same order uh, of the deviation. Um, and if you take in mind here, it goes towards the limb. This is the outer ring, which deviates. And the inner ring here, maybe this part, uh, is quite equal. So comparing now all lines we measured, we really get the systematics of the convective blue shift. And um, I want to show only like two examples of the center to limb variation of line profiles or, or asymmetries. So maybe interesting would be the 6301.5 uh, line, which is often used for spectral polarimetry. And um, we can see how uh, the line profile or the, the bisector profile uh, differs from this center here in dark blue towards the solar limb uh, in, in red. So it really also turns into a backslash shape from the C shape to a backslash shape at around 0 0.6 and then even reverses. So it saturates towards a value around maybe, let's say, 100 meters per second of redshift in the line core at the very solar limb. So we cannot talk about a, sort of a convective blue shift anymore, but now it would be a convective redshift. Or in formal literature, is what's called supergravitational redshift. OK, this is a line uh, in the, let's say, mid photosphere. Let's go higher up. Let's take the sodium D1 line, which goes up 
into probably the lower chromosphere. And surprisingly, your asymmetry looks like this. At disk center, you have a C shape in the parts which are photospheric, then it saturates and um, saturates maybe towards a value also around this let's say 50 60 70 meters per second of redshift already at the so already at disk center but if you go towards the solar limb you can see the saturations saturation happens faster and it is more or less stable here so you have this really saturation to 70 uh, meters per second of redshift so again we cannot talk about a convective blue shift or a redshift if we compare now all lines we have measured, or the key first the key lines, um, and compare the bisector profiles of these lines, and I listed them here. Here we have this uh, sodium D1 line again. Here are some iron lines, iron 2, which uh, happens in the, in the deeper photosphere. This this line is also nice because it has no crosstalk bec between Q and U, and Wow, what happened here? This is the carbon one line at 5380. Um, it has a really big convective blue shift. And um, what I have to mention here, uh, the, the reference velocity, the reference wavelength um, of, well, for the Doppler velocity calibration um, had a bigger uncertainty. So it could also vary by like 100, 200 meters per second here. And on the other side, this line is very temperature sensitive, so um, it does not appear that well in the intergranulum, more in the granules. So um, this, this blue shift, this strong blue shift, is mainly caused only by granulation itself. Well, if it goes, if you go to the umbra and, and there you have it even cooler, then this line is blended a lot by molecules. But here in this case, I think it's just that we observe only granules. Okay, these are the key lines. If I take all lines, I mean, we have we have a broader spectrum, like only uh, these several lines, but including all lines, it would look like this. So I sketched here the bisectors in gray and uh, as asterisks the uh, line cores. And what, well, my feeling was it follows more or less um, a linear regression. If you have deeper lines, well, of course, then you have uh, less convective blue shift because you get higher up in the atmosphere, uh, you have your gradient, and also the inverse granulation, which causes this. But nicely, if you, if you would extrapolate it to 1.0, so to the continuum, you would end up like at 700 meters per second convective blue shift. Okay, so what you in principle could do is, okay, you know your spectral line depth and you would know by this regression where it should mainly be in convective blue shift. Yeah. Okay, another important part of, of our uh, publication, which is now in press, is um, your disk to center variation. Um, of the convective blue shift if you take only the line core. So here I sketched the center limb variations for all lines as dashed lines and then ordered them according to the line depth. And um, what you see here, these uh, very um, weak lines from the, from the lower photosphere, they just decrease in convective blue shift. Also here these, these lines in the upper photosphere um, they vary not so significantly, um, but if you have lines in the middle photosphere, you can see um, how the convective blue shift increases first toward positions of like mu of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and um, the higher you go, well, the higher you go, the more uh, your point of reversal moves towards the disk center. And this is actually quite interesting because here from this 
we can extract the information of horizontal granulation, so or horizontal motion of granulation. So in the middle photosphere, we can observe this transition um, from from vertical to to horizontal and then inverse uh, quite well. And uh, Horst Balthasar sketched this already in the 80s. This here are your line of sights towards your granulation. This is the log tau. And you have your, your granulation, granular motion here. Granulation, intergranulation. So you have peaks and valleys. And uh, here your horizontal motion. And if you observe that uh, cosine between 1 and 0 0.6, you can you can have different angle angles towards your uh, flow, and especially the the horizontal flow. Okay, um, now I want to say a few words about spectral resolution because for for instrument scientists it's also important um, to take this into account. Well, here we had a, a very high spectral resolution of more than 700,000, so you really um, sample your whole line profile. But if we go to lower spectral resolution, like we have, for example, for WISP, which would be maybe here, at this order of 250,000, is this correct, Alfred? Yeah. Yeah, OK. In the visible, or uh, if you go to VTF, your line profile, if you observe it with the same uh, with the same camera would look like this. So we go from black to blue. Well, the changes might not be that big, but if you go for the bisector, you really see uh, the variation. So here we still have the C-shape, but if you go to lower spectral resolution, this C-shape vanishes, and you have maybe only a straight line here. So depending um, whether you make your uh, line core velocities, uh, Doppler velocities, this can change only by the spectral resolution by 100 meters per second. So mm, the comparison would be if I observe Doppler shifts for the whole line profile, would it be affected by the spectral resolution? And I compared uh, these dash profiles of the different spectral resolutions here, and you can see no, they coincide quite well. So if you compute Doppler shifts for your whole line profile, yeah, your, your spectral resolution dash does not matter. But if you observe only line line core velocities, the Doppler shift of the line core, you have big, big deviations. And uh, yeah, this has to be taken into account. Also nice in this plot, um, I want to hint to the synthesis Heather Siegler did last year. And um, I overplotted here the synthesis uh, for only uh, the line core here in, in solid and for the full line profile. And uh, a little different to the synthesis I presented before for Hans Ginter Ludwig, here we see a variation. So it can be improved. And um, I guess we will also work on this together with Heather and some of, some of the star guys. So I would like to end up my talk, giving a little outlook, maybe for future observations. Um, also interesting for WISP observations, which we will do here uh, at HAO. So reference calibration of Doppler grams. This could be interesting if you want to go for small scale variations of the Doppler velocities at high, spec uh, at high spatial resolution. So if you want to make sure, OK, is it an upflow or is it a downflow? An upflow of 50 meters per second or downflow of 50 meters per second makes a difference. So um, what I did in the, in the latest publication, which is now in press and A&A, &A, is to give a list of all reference velocities which you could take. So you go um, for the spectral line, then select the line section. Is it Was it the full line profile, the Doppler shift of the full line profile, or only the core? Uh, define your spectral resolution, and then your position on the sun. Yeah. Independent uh, if you are on the northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere. And then take your uh, reference velocity. 
So here an example for, for a sunspot. Yeah, well, maybe it's not uh, not the best case. So I, I sketched here, select uh, a quiet sun region of, of your Doppler gram. Well, I selected this part, but um, this might not be quiet sun. Maybe it is affected already by flows. Mode flow could happen here. Um, but just as a test uh, test case, you could use a quiet sun region and then calibrate or calculate the, the average velocity here uh, for that region spatially and temporally because you have uh, oscillations, P mode oscillations. So better take a data set of more than 30 minutes in time and then uh, look up the reference velocity <coughs> along according to the line, line section, resolution and mu position. And for example, if you have WISP observations at uh, like sunspot close to disk center, 0, 9, 5, you would end up like here for your uh, velocity of the, of the line core. And you can see it makes a difference uh, if you use the whole line profile at 240 meters per second blue shift or 100 meters per second blue shift um, yeah, with WISP or BTF. So use this value then to calibrate the Doppler gram with this relative offset. Yeah? And then I would say you would have uh, accuracy or an uncertainty uh, less than 50 meters per second. So uh, I want to summarize um, our findings and give the conclusions. So we performed till now the most accurate and precise spectroscopic observations of the sun with visible lines. So at the meter per second accuracy, no instrument was able to perform that before. Then for the sunspot umbra, we had uh, tested if there is still convection left. Yes, there was still some convection. Of course, it was reduced, but depending on your magnetic field strength, it was not zero. So the umbra is not at rest. I talked with Chuck Beckers about it, but he, he was not disappointed, but uh, happy that I uh, checked that. And um, then the convective blue shift of the quiet sun. So um, the line asymmetry and the line shift varies strongly from disk center toward the solar lamp. Then you have this dependence um, with your um, spectral line and the line depth. So your, your dependence of the height in the atmosphere, basically, is that. And um, well, we have we have seen that these horizontal granular flows gradually affect the center limb variation. So this horizontal motion, which you have seen in this diagram, uh, with the ordered line depth. And um, well, of course, we have variation with the spectral resolution itself. So it matters with with, with which instrument you are observing. And um, well, last but not least, I, I presented the uh, indirect recalibration, I name it like this, of Doppler grams with accurate reference velocities. So to get um, accuracies of better than 100 meters per second, which could be quite useful for future studies, I think. And um, the end. Synthesis of line profiles and the convective blue shift itself and the model atmospheres can they are quite good already, but they can or, or need to be improved to apply uh, our solar test bed to other stars. And this, I think, could improve and, and has to improve the exoplanet detection. Well, not of, of big exoplanets, but of habitable, maybe Earth like exoplanets. And this is crucial for that. OK, so I want to end my talk here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we have time for some questions. Ricky isn't here, but Michael is. So. I always thought this uh, going after the C shapes in detail was infinitely boring, something <laughs> that only horse spiders are have the tenacity to do. And you, you've shown that that was very valuable work indeed, now that you can look at this with this accurate.
Sian Dan that's certainly in a very big step in this direction. However, I was a little disappointed that when you showed this uh, bias that the HMI has, and you gained an understanding how the spectral uh, uh, resolution plays into a signal and so on, uh, would there be a way to assess this bias a little bit and then come to a modified HMI C shape? Well, not an HMI C shape. For HMI, you just only have this these six. HMI curve ah, okay, okay. Um, yeah, yeah well, maybe to get the question correct, I mean, we already applied the same method um, explicitly for to our observations um, to get the direct comparison with HMI. So I think the only yeah, way. Then you see HMI sort of is way off. Yeah. Then you see HMI might be biased because of this artificial fringes. Yeah. These fringes, uh, and from what you talked about later, my understanding is the difference in spectral resolution will also play into this. Mm -hmm. uh, but 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 here we already get rid of the difference in spectral resolution. Yeah. By this so test case, but but what you can in principle do is uh, calibrate your uh, your fringes from yeah. HMI and then use the observations uh, to to recalibrate HMI. Yeah. yeah. And this would be a nice test, uh, of course. I yeah, agree. Yeah, that would be a nice test. I was wondering what HMI detection you use, the line of sight or the vector data? Just uh, the normal Doppler grams. Yeah. Okay. So we did not. So there's a lot more precise than the vector mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't correct for the systematics. We need to find the vector. Yeah. Anyone else? I have another question. Yeah. So if you would do this with really high accuracy, what point could you measure the gravitational constant by having determined everything else? Oh, yeah, well, um, I would say to improve your accuracy to better than 10 centimeters per second is mm -hmm. quasi impossible. I mean, now we ended up already at like one meter per second. And there, there are other, uh, even newer uh, laser frequency comp, which are also temperature stabilized and, and yeah, have the state of the art um, electronics. So probably there you can go to like 20, 30 centimeters per second uh, accuracy. And while well, determining the, well, of course you can. You have to use this because you have the, the repeatability of the measurement. You know at all times for future at which position you are, at which wavelength position. So if you, if you perform your measurement like in 100 years, it would have the same accuracy and repeatability. And this is a perfect, perfect uh, opportunity for us, I guess. Yeah, and the gravitational constant is still the least accurate of the fundamental constants. Yeah, I think maybe maybe, maybe with this laser frequency comps and, and uh, high resolution spectrograph, it's the only way to uh, to measure that. It's actually an interesting idea because measuring the gravitational constant is quite hard, and the way people do it is they. A torsion balance, so it's a string with um, yep. two masses on, on it, um, and you spin it around, and then you have test masses next to it, and you measure the um, the, the traction of the, the torsion balance masses to the test masses. This would be a completely different way of measuring uh, or determining the gravitational constant. Um, I think it would, 
actually be quite interesting to see because you, uh, if you only measure something one way, you always have to be nervous about systematic issues. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it would be fascinating to do, it, see what you get. But I'm not sure that you'll. And people have spent a lot of time making these torsion balances very accurate, and mm -hmm. very precise. But um, I'd be surprised if you could do better than what they're doing. But at least it'd be um, an independent verification. It's an interesting idea. But you have to plan for long term. Yeah. So you get funding for 20 years, and then, yeah. then you're fine. Two hundred years. But <laughs> so, for me, the last issue now, the umbra is not at rest. Yeah. Jack Baker is strong, yeah. uh, which is well, always uh, nice uh, to hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, he measured he measured twenty five meters per second in average, and I think this was already great to measure in the seventies. So this is, what does it tell us about what, what's going on in the sun? Well, it tells us that the, the convection is not entirely suppressed. Um, maybe there could be umbral dots with l slight uh, convective motion and depending on your magnetic field strength, if, it, if your magnetic, magnetic field is denser, you would have less umbral dots and less yeah. uh, less convective motion. If you have complete suppression, probably for sunspots above 4 kilo gauss or so, um, then your convection could be entirely suppressed. But for these sunspots, they were like between 2 and 2.8 kilo gauss. Uh, you have still some. Um, Interaction, so in the interaction you mentioned, uh, the, to measure the radial velocity, uh, you, uh, you have a model, right? Can you speak up a little bit? Oh, sorry. So, saying that in the interaction you mentioned about that uh, the sunspot cycle could uh, introduce some periodicity in the, in the radial velocity measurement, right? Yeah. So, how can sunspot cycle uh, introduce? This between uh, exoplanet detection and sunspot, or, or between uh, intrinsic variation of the sun, you mean? Yes. Well, this is uh, this is the tricky question. You said it, uh, it can, right? This only depends between the. Well, I, I talked to people of this uh, Sun of a Star community and also for exoplanet detection, and uh, they are not sure. They they don't uh, know the variation of the star itself. So what they do is they interpret this uh, convective motion signal, which is intrinsic to the star itself, as an exoplanet. Yeah. So. So the, and there's a false, a large number of false detections as a result. Uh, yes, yeah, since this is recorded here, uh, <laughs> I am careful, but. Uh, it's okay. I've been on that for a few. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that. I, I would say you just have to be careful with the interpretation of that signal. And uh, yeah, know about this convective blue shift. It's important. All right, I think I'll uh, close the discussion here. It is 3 o'clock. So let's thank you, Hans, again. Help yourself with some extra cake, yeah? <laughs>